Second Timothy chapter 2, we're going to be reading verses 1 through 13. Second Timothy 2, 1 through 13. I'll read the odd-numbered verses. On my own, you join me on the even-numbered verses and on verse 13, please. Second Timothy 2, beginning verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man uh, also strive for masteries, yet he is not crowned, except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evil doer, uh, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for it, if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. And now let's pray. Father. Please uh, use preacher and empower him as he brings the word of God. Help us to be attentive to uh, the preaching. Now, in Jesus' name we ask, amen. Okay, you may be seated. The blood that Jesus shed for me Way back on Calvary, the blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. It reaches to the highest mountain, it flows to the lowest valley, the blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. It soothes my doubts and calms my fears, and it dries all my tears. The blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. It reaches to the highest mountain and flows to the lowest valley. Oh, the blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. And I'm, I'm pumped up this morning. I am so excited to be able to get into the Word of God and and uh, songs like that, it's hard not to get excited about it. Aren't you glad that God's blood never loses its power? You know, that it was only, it's not just potent for a little while, you know, and then it dissipates, but for all eternity, it's like that. 
You know, I love, love, love hearing songs as a reminder to those truths. Well, you got your Bibles open to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 13 this morning. We're going to give you a, uh, I sat down this week, and of course, for the last couple of weeks with Veterans Day uh, being on the calendar, and I knew it was going to be today, I knew that God was speaking to my heart about having some type of a Veterans Day message, and uh, just how it applies to us as individuals, and and uh, the Bible talks about being a soldier. You know, it talks about uh, you know a lot when in regards to being in, in God's army, and uh, of course, you know, it, it's it's just as much of a um, a choice to join God's army as it is for many of you that signed up. You know, for the military, the U.S. military. You know, you made that decision. My father-in-law couldn't say the same. You know, my father-in-law was actually given the choice, go to prison or go, <laughs> go to Vietnam. So <laughs> I think I'd probably choose the same thing he did. I'd go to Vietnam before I go to prison. You know, but I would say a good majority of the time, 99.9% of the time, you know, uh, you chose to sign up with the military. And when it comes to our lives as Christians in God's army, it's similar, and we're going to look at some of these similarities today. But I figured I'd start with this illustration. I, I, I've uh, ashamedly, ashamedly, a lot of the, uh, the holidays that we celebrate in our nation, I even believe, you know, not only the younger kids, younger than me, but, you know, but my generation has no understanding of why we celebrate these, these days. You know, Memorial Day has become a, a, a day for an extra day to get out of school. And, you know, a lot of these holidays like Veterans Day are kind of just passed over unless it's someone who was in the military or maybe a government organization uh, uh, identifying it. So I did want to give you a little background history as a way of introduction for this message into, uh, into Veterans Day and how it came about. It was not, uh, at the very beginning, it was not known as Veterans Day. And, of course, this is all stuff that I learned this week. Uh, but U.S. President w uh, Woodrow Wilson first book claimed an Armistice Day or Armistice Day for November 11th, 1919. You know, how many of you have been around since 1919? No, <laughs> I didn't think so. You know, so <laughs> but, uh, you know, in, in, in proclaiming it as a holiday, he said to us in America, the reflections of Armistice Day will be filled with solemn pride and the heroism of those who died in the country's service. And with gratitude for the victory, both because of the thing from which it was freed us uh, and because of the opportunity it has given America to show her sympathy with peace and justice to the councils of the nations. The United States Congress passed a concurrent resolution seven years later on June 4th, 1926, uh, requesting that the president, Calvin Coolidge at this time, just a, just a fun fact for you, only Vermont president, you know, I, <laughs> uh, I issued another proclamation to observe November 11th with appropriate ceremonies. An act approved on May 13th, 1938, approved the 11th of November in each year a legal holiday. In 1953, an Emporia, Kansas shoe store owner named Alfred King had the idea to expand Armist Day to celebrate all veterans not just those who served in World War I. King, uh, King began a campaign to turn Armist Day into All Veterans Day. The Emporia Chamber of Commerce took up the cause after determining that 90% of Emporia merchants, as well as the Board of Education, supported closing their doors on November 11th to honor veterans. With the help of the U.S. Representatives Ed Rees, also from Emporia, a bill from the holiday was pushed through Congress. President Dwight Eisenhower uh, signed it into law on May 26, 1954. Congress amended this act on June 1, 1954, replacing Armas with veterans, and it has been known as Veterans Day ever since. You know, it's a, it's a huge encouragement to me as, as a, a Christian, as an American, to have opportunities to be able to not only recognize those who were in service for our nation, to but be encouraged that we live in a nation that's free because of it. You know, and we as a whole, you know, if you look at study history, you know, people want to stamp out history for a reason. You know, and I look at America and and the fact that this is all a side note, this is all introduction this morning of how we've treated our veterans. 
you know, you could go back to, you know, uh, Vietnam War and, and, of course, talk of my father-in-law and Mr. Kaib and others that are, uh, were Vietnam War veterans and seeing the way they were treated coming back from that war. You know, we, we have to make sure that we recognize these holidays to, to be, be an encouragement to those that have served as soldiers in our U.S. military. But so much so, so more as, as Christians, it's an encouragement and a reminder to us that we are battling a war as well. That each and every one of us that is a saved individual in here this morning is enlisted in an army. We are a soldier for Christ. You know, my question to you this morning to think about for this entire message is this. Are you involved serving Christ? Are you involved serving Christ? You know, I'm going to give you the four E's of service this morning. The four E's of service. So keep your Bibles handy. I want you to take your Bibles at this time and turn to Psalms 108. Psalms 108, the four E's of service. And I thought about this when it came to this passage, and all of our points are going to come from this passage, but four different things that this passage talks about, or at least three of them, and then one of them that I added to, because you can't be, uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but number one, you know, in order for you to serve, number one, you have to be enlisted. You have to be enlisted. Number one, enlisted in. You know, the four E's of service, enlisted in. You know, recently, within the last... Uh, Oh, probably I would live the last two or three months, you know, when it came to the campaigning of, of individuals for their state senates and their state congress and whatever the case may be, there was an individual that came out and he made the biggest mistake of saying, you know, well, when I was serving in Vietnam, he never served in Vietnam. You know, not one. There was no military record. It doesn't matter. You can say that you serve, but if you never enlisted, you didn't serve. You know, yeah, yeah, it doesn't happen that way, folks. You know, it just, it, it does not happen. Now, he had the age, he could have served, but he didn't. You know, so uh, there's an importance to understanding. In order to be in a soldier, you have to be enlisted. Number one, enlisted in. You know, so you got Psalms 108, verse 13. We're going to look at that in a minute, but I want to give you a couple things before we get to Psalms 108, verse 13. To accept Jesus' gift of eternal life is to accept an enlistment into his army. His side of this spiritual war we are in is the winning side. You know, you have to understand, in order for you to be involved in service to God, you have to enlist first. In order for you to serve your country in a military fashion, you have to enlist. You know, yeah, you can serve in some way or shape or form your country, but in order to be a soldier in this country, in order to claim to be a soldier or be a part of it, you have to be enlisted. You know, so my question to you along these lines at this point is, have you enlisted? You know, I don't know about you, but, you know, uh, has anybody ever taken a Bible and shared with you from the Bible how you can know for sure you're going to heaven? You know, I look around the room and I think, um, I, would, I would assume, you know, looking at this crowd here today, that every single one of you can think of a time that you've accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. You know, but there may be someone in here this morning. I don't know. You know, I can't see your heart. It's between you and God you know, that maybe has not really truly put your trust 100% confidence in Jesus Christ as Savior. You might have been trusting in salvation plus baptism. You might be trusting in salvation plus good works. You may be trusting in salvation and coming to church or, you know, adding whatever the case may be. But let me be an encouragement to you this morning. If you trusted in anything else other than Jesus Christ alone for salvation, that is not true salvation. It's Jesus Christ plus nothing. And you say, preacher, why, why, you know, why are you going over this? You know, why is it that on a Sunday morning, well, typically on a Sunday morning, salvation, a salvation message is applicable because we usually have visitors. But what I've found so often in the last, I think it's been six months to a year since starting our discipleship program, I've been able to lead three people to Christ that were trusting in Jesus Christ plus something else in order to get them to heaven. Just recently, I, I, I went through a, the very first lesson in, um, in, in our discipleship program with an individual one-on-one, -on -one. and I got down to the very end of that lesson, and this individual said, you know, I, I, he goes, I didn't really put my trust 100% in Jesus Christ alone. He goes, I was putting my trust in, you know, uh, uh, baptism. I had to be baptized and be saved. I go, well, what do you think you should do then? You know, I wanted him to say it. I didn't want to try to force him into it. So he goes, well, he goes, I think I need to get saved. And I go, well, if you, if you think you need to get saved, let's get it settled. I go, because as the Bible says, it's Jesus Christ plus nothing. 
And you say, well, I understand, preacher, you know, isn't baptism important? Of course it is. Baptism is important. I look at that as being that first step of obedience after salvation in a relationship with Christ. You know, but the reason why it's not important for heaven, meaning it helps you get to heaven, is that would mean that Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross wasn't enough. And as we know, that shed blood, just like Brother McAllister saying this morning, that power is still there today. We don't need baptism for heaven. All we need is Jesus Christ. That's it. You know, but we need to understand that enlistment has to be the right type of enlistment. You know, have you enlisted? Look at Psalms 108, 108 verse 13. Through God, we shall do, or we shall do val valiantly. For he it is that shall tread down our enemies. You know, it's God through us, not ourselves. You know, this spiritual war that we're going through, it cannot be won by your own free will. You cannot win against the devil on your own. You cannot win against the, the, uh, the, the, the agents of darkness, if you will, on your own. You have to be enlisted in Christ's army. You have to be tapping into the power of God. Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, this pa I love this passage because Paul's writing the, the Roman people that here, the church in Rome, and he's explaining to them, hey, you need to enlist. You need to make sure that you, your, your, your trust is in the right thing, that it's in Jesus Christ. And if you have trusted in Jesus Christ, there ain't nothing that's going to take you out of it. You know, once you've enlisted, you know, it's either, you know, death and you're standing before your creator, you know, or, or that's it. That, that's all it is. It, you cannot get out of God's army. You know, you know, once you're enlisted, you're enlisted. I praise God the fact that there is nothing that can separate us once we've enlisted. You know, that you're there. There is no greater decision one can make than putting their trust in Jesus Christ and him alone for salvation. You won't regret your enlistment. You know, if I were to go to you, and don't raise your hands, but for those of you who have, who have served in our U.S. military, you know, I'm, I'm sure, I think I even talked to you about this a little bit, Mr. Bella, you know, just in conversation without you even saying it. You know, I don't think there's any doubt in my mind that you regret going into the military. Not one iota in my mind that I've had any conversation with you that you felt that way. You know, almost any individual that I've ever talked to, I would say a good majority of them, it's of that lines. I, I don't regret one iota serving in the military. You know what? One of the greatest decisions you can make is enlisting in God's army. You won't regret it. When you stand before God and you hear that phrase, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful in a few things, let me make you ruler over many. You know, you won't regret it. You know, you won't regret enlisting in God's army when you stand before God and, and uh, those who have denied him, those who have not put their trust in Jesus Christ for salvation alone have to go to an eternal hell when you get to go to an eternal heaven. You know, there's not going to be any regrets there, folks. The, don't get to the point of where you stand before God and God opens up that book of life and can't find your name in it. That'll be one of the biggest regrets you'll ever make. You'll look at it and think, why didn't I just make the decision? Why didn't I just listen to what God was telling me to make as a decision? You know, my heart breaks for those that don't take that opportunity. You know, you will not regret your enlistment into God's army and accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior. Number two, look at uh, verse number three. You have your Bible still in, uh, in 2 Timothy chapter two. If you don't, turn back to 2 Timothy chapter two. We're going to look at verse number three here. 
This is where we get the, the next three parts. In uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, we'll see the next three parts of the four E's of, of service. So number one, in order to serve, you got to be enlisted. you got to be enlisted. You know, I, I go back to, uh, you know, the passage in my mind, and this is not part of the message this morning. It's not written down in my notes, but the sons of Sceva, you know, the individuals that were trying to cast out devils in Christ's name who were not saved individuals, and the devils leapt upon them. You know, you can't serve God if you're not saved. You know, you have to have put your trust in Jesus Christ as Savior. You know, you can spend your whole life. You know, there are going to be individuals that will stand before God and say, but I prophesied in your name. I did all these good things. And you know what they're going to hear? Depart from me. I didn't know you. I didn't know you. You know, never once did you come to me and, and, and ask me to be your personal Savior. Never once did you try to have a relationship with me, quote, unquote, in that manner. You know, that, that's going to be a hard day for people. Have you enlisted? Number two, look at verse number three of, of 2 Timothy chapter two. Verse number three, the Bible says this, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Number two, enduring as. So number one, enlisted in. Number two, enduring as a good soldier. How many of you, you veterans in here this morning or uh, have served in military We said it was, you know, basic training was easy? Was basic training easy for you all? You know, I've not, I have not heard one person I've talked to that has told me that basic training is easy. My brother-in-law just got back, or brother-in-law, my brother just got back from a uh, uh, Marine boot camp. You know, and, uh, you know, his very words to me were, was this. He goes, the first week or two I was there, he goes, I thought about quitting. And, and I, I, I looked at him and I said, well, I'm proud of you, man, for going all the way through. I go, I'm proud of you for, for being willing to serve your country, for enduring, you know, through that. You know, hey, it's not easy to be a soldier. If it was easy to be a soldier, everybody would do it. You know, everybody would be signing up for the U.S. military. You know, everybody would be looking at it and saying, man, that, you know, what do you want to be? You know, I want to be a soldier. I want to be, you know, whatever the case may be. You know, it, wouldn't, it would be something everybody would be doing. The word endure means to bear, to sustain, to support without breaking or yielding to force or pressure. You know, boot camp, what are they trying to do? Tear you down so they can build you back up. Brother Gallano, I heard, uh, uh, I did not have the opportunity to hear Brother Hiles say this, but I know Brother Hiles, when he was alive, would say this, to, and I heard it reiterated when I was in college, that he looked at Hiles Anderson College as being the spiritual boot camp for those who were preparing for ministry. You know, he, he looked at it and said, you know, what we're trying to do is tear you down so that God can build you back up. So that God could give you the necessary tools. You know, to be honest with you, I didn't understand those statements when I was in my freshman year of college. But as I went through, and as I graduated, and even after college, seeing what God put me through to help me to understand, hey, if you're able to endure that, you can endure this. And if you're able to endure this, you can endure this. You know, you can go through and endure as a soldier. You know, war is messy. Lives hang in the balance. And they count on us to soldier on. They count on us to soldier on. There are individuals every single you know, minute of the day that are dying and going to hell. And a lot of the reason is, I wouldn't say all of it, but a good majority of the reason is because us, the Christians, those who are enlisted in God's army, aren't willing to soldier on. We're not willing to endure. We're not willing to endure the criticism of our family. We're not willing to endure the, 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 the trials and tribulations of, of the unbelievers and the Bible critics. Hey, folks, you know, I deal with individuals on a weekly, monthly basis that criticize the Bible, that don't believe in God. You know how discouraging that can get, to, not just to a pastor, but just as a Christian, to be around that. You know, it's real easy to say, you know what, I'm, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. You know, it's really easy to get to that point where you think, no, I, I'm thrown in the towel. I can't do this anymore. God, you know what? If they don't want to believe, let them all go to hell. You know, that's easy to get into that mentality. I can understand, you know, where Jesus Christ would have had every right to look at mankind and said, you know what? I'm not willing to endure the cross. I'm not willing to put myself through this for mankind. He endured. We need to endure. You know, we need to, as Christians, we're, we've been enlisted you know, we need to endure as soldiers. If, if lives are going to be saved, if souls are going to be won, we have to endure. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation 
which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 10, the passage just read. Paul himself. Hey, you know why I'm enduring? For the elect's sakes. For what reason? That they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Paul looked at and said, hey, the reason why I need to endure is for your sakes. For those that are the unsaved. For those that need the encouragement. For those that need to be able to, to have the extra boost of motivation to carry on. You know, it shouldn't be just Paul's motivation. It should be every single Christian in this room today to endure for someone else's sake. There are lives that are hanging in the balance. You know, we just heard uh, recently, and I, I won't you know, go over it again, but uh, we had Mark Edwards here that presented his ministry on a Wednesday evening and, you know, the, the F Feinauer family and, and, of course, the Johnson family that we've been supporting for years talking about their ministries that they're a part of around the, around the world. And, you know, uh, if that doesn't prick your heart to do more for God, maybe you need to reevaluate and sit down and say, well, Lord, why is it that I don't feel pricked in my heart? Lord, speak to me to do more for you as a soldier of Christ. Lord, help me to endure so that maybe my family member would get saved. You know, maybe my, uh, my co-worker would get saved. You know, maybe my neighbor would get saved. Whatever the case may be, you may be the only Bible someone reads. You may be living your life enduring. You know, the times that you're doing good is not when your neighbors are paying the most attention. It's when the times go rough is when they're paying the most attention. Those individuals that are unbelievers, they're looking at, at us as Christians that, that are going through a hard time and saying, let's see what their faith goes through now. You know, let's evaluate it. Oh, you got cancer in your life? Let's see, let's see how you, you, know, you believe in God now. Oh, you've, you're dealing with a loss in your life? Oh, you've got you know, financial difficulties in your life? You know, are you really believing in what you say you believe? You know, you may be the, Bible, the, the only Bible someone reads. You know how often I've heard of loved ones? Family members that are unbelievers, that have a family member that is a believer, that's stuck through and endured through hard times where the family members get saved because of it. They say, well, you know, you didn't act the way I would act. You know, a typical person would panic, freak out, you know, I just go into utter turmoil and spiral around in destruction, you know, but you, you're different. You know, the stuff that you're talking about, there must be some truth to that. What is it? You know, and they turn to God because of it. You know, it's not just giving scripture. You know, it's getting them to the point where they can receive it. And it may be through your life, enduring. Enduring as a good soldier of Christ. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us, set, uh, uh, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Hey, life gets heavy, folks. War's messy. You know, sometimes you get injured. And it gets real easy to want to throw in the towel. And you got this passage here in Hebrews. And of course, you know, I don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. You know, the theologians have been debating who it was for years. It's been written in similarities to Paul. I'd like to think it's Paul that wrote it. It doesn't matter who you think that wrote it. The author of the book is saying, hey, consider Christ. He could have thrown in the towel. He could have looked at mankind and said, enough's enough. Yet he endured. He endured for us. So in those times where you want to quit, think about Christ. In those times where uh, it gets tough, think about Christ, what he went through. You know, what he went through pales in comparison to what we're going through, folks. And not only that, but he can help you to get through it. Endure as a good soldier in Christ. Enlisted in. Enduring as. Number three. Number three. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 4. The next verse. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Number three, entangled not. Entangled not. So number one, we've got enlisted in. In order for you to be a soldier, you've got to enlist. 
In order for you to be in God's army, you've got to have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Number two, enduring as. You know, and being enlisted means you're going to have to endure some hardships. There's going to be some pain that is involved. You know, no pain, no, pain, no gain. You know, uh, if there's not some pain down, if there's not some tearing down to be able to, to build back up, you know, it's kind of hard to build on fat. You got to tear down the fat muscles to be able to put in some muscle. You know, there's got to be tearing down in order to be built up. Number three, entangled not. We need to keep ourselves free from the things that would hinder us and wound us as soldiers in Christ's army. We need to keep ourselves free from the things that would hinder us and wound us as soldiers in Christ's army. Romans chapter 12. Turn to Romans chapter 12 this morning. Entangled not. We need to keep ourselves free from the things that would hinder us and would wound us as soldiers in Christ's army. Hey, it's easy to get distracted from a main cause. You know, fear can be a distraction. You know, if you study history and you study war, especially going back to World War II and uh, D-Day, you know, uh, stories of individuals being dropped off the boats that immediately panic about what's going on and run in fear. You know, and there's stories of, of commanders and individuals that looked at it and said, hey, I, I don't have time for fear. We need to press forward or we're going to lose more life. You know, as individuals, as Christians in God's army, we, we don't have time to spare. We've got the time that we've been given now. We need to use it wisely. We cannot be entangled distracted in fear, distracted in those things that are around us that the world is throwing at us. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I use this verse here as a re for a reason this morning because th this ver these verses being given by Paul are a reminder to us as Christians. We cannot be in the world and in Christ at the same time. You know, we can't be lukewarm Christians. We need to be all in for God. Be poured into God's mold, not into the world's mold. You know, there are so many distractions that are out there. Hey, entertainment is not a bad thing. But what happens a good majority of time, especially in Americans' lives, is we are so easily distracted by entertainment. You know, it's so easy to, you know, get consumed in our life with, oh, what's the newest movie that's coming out? You know, oh, what's the, you know, latest, greatest piece of technology that's coming out? You know, oh, you know, it, hey, politics is a good thing, folks, but I know people that are just consumed with it, consumed to the point where that's, they live and breathe politics. Politics are a good thing. Because you should know who to vote for. You should know what's going on in your country. But when it starts to take away from other things, it's a distraction. And the devil will use anything he can. Satan's agents will use anything they can to entangle us so we cannot fight the battles that we have. You know, that we become useless, if you will, or hindered, if you will, when it comes to the spiritual battles we will face. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. The Bible says, Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same aff afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. You know, hey, we need to be aware. There is an enemy. You know, you don't go into war and not try to learn about your enemy and how he works and how, you know, how the tactics are. Part of war is learning as much as you can about the enemy. You know, and in this war, the spiritual battle we're in, if we don't understand the enemy's tactics, you will get entangled. You will be trapped. You will end up in a position of where, you know, you're, you're hindered from being able to help someone else, you know, out. You know, I, I've used this often. I remember when Steve Currington, uh, when I, one of the things he had said in the 10 Principles DVD, you know, I said the 10 years that I was away from God. The 10 years that I was uh, uh, in the world and, and gave my life over to drugs and, 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 and alcohol, he goes, I didn't have any concern of God. He goes, I wasn't helping anybody for the cause of Christ. He goes, I get, I get back to God, and he goes, then I feel like I was making up for lost time. My in-laws, the same exact, exact thing. You know, my in-laws, my, my mother-in-law and father-in-law, you know, not this exact phrase has been used, but they feel like they're making up for lost time. 
you know, doing everything they possibly can to, to lead as many people to Christ as they possibly can. You know, as individuals, don't allow things to entangle you in the world so much so that it causes you to look back and say, man, 20 years has gone by, and who have I led to Christ? What impact have I made in this war, you know, for Christ? Entangled not. In order for us to make an impact, in order for us to serve, we need to make sure we know our enemy, to not allow ourselves to get entangled. Number four and last, doing very good on time this morning, really good time. Number four and last, look at verses five through ten again in uh, 2 Timothy chapter two, verses five through ten. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully? The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. You know, I, I love the, the, this fact. That it helps you understand that Paul, he said, hey, they look at me as being an evildoer. You know, the world is going to look at us as soldiers as being an evildoer. You know, hey, I'm trying to help you. No, you're not. You're trying to hurt me. They don't understand that it's help. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sakes, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Number four and last, engaged for. Engaged for. So we've got number one, enlisted in. Number two, enduring as. Number three, entangled not. Number four, engaged for. The word engaged means to be earnestly employed, zealous. You know, as soldiers, you know, we need to be engaged in this battle, not sitting on the sidelines. We need to be aware that there, are, uh, that there is a duty that each and every one of us has, that there is no duty that is not important. Every single soldier in Christ's army is important, all the way from the youngest child all the way up to the oldest adult. Every single individual is important in God's army. There is not one person that is unimportant. Not one. You know, you ask these veterans that have gone uh, into the military, you know, those platoons, you know, hey, every single one of them is relying on one another. You know, my brother has posted a lot on Facebook over the last uh, couple weeks uh, and month since he's been home from, from the Marines, and I can see what they've drilled into him. You know, and, and he, uh, you know, I was posted recently about, he goes, man, he goes, I consider it an honor to not only serve as a Marine, but also to serve with those individuals that I was at boot camp with, my brothers in arms, if you will. You know, and that's the way we need to look at, look at it, being engaged in this, in this soldier's army that God has put us into, Christ's army, actively engaged, being willing to, uh, uh, to, to serve one another. We must be actively serving. We must be actively serving. You know, there is no discharge until you stand before Christ. That is the discharge. You know, you are engaged from the time you get saved till the time you die and stand before your, your God and you get that medal, if you will, that crown that God talks about in the Bible. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and verse 9. We're going to look at two passages in 1 Corinthians and then one last passage in Colossians and then we'll wrap this up this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and verse 9. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm passionate about this as a Christian, not just as a pastor, because I'm sick of seeing the way Satan has destroyed Christianity. I'm sick of seeing casualties. I'm sick of seeing Christians that have gotten saved and now don't believe the Bible. You know, I'm sick of seeing Christians that get saved and, and look at it and say, oh, well, you know what? You know, facts choose otherwise. I'm sorry, folks. I've seen way too much that backs the Bible to say that it does, it's, not, it's truth. It is truth. You know, you can trust God's word. You know, and if you can trust God's word, you can trust his power to, it, to help empower you to fight this battle that you're going through. We need soldiers. You know, hey, you've seen those, those signs of, what is it, Uncle Sam, you know, we need you type deal. You know, God's coming to us and saying, hey, I need you. He goes, I don't need you to be entangled. I need you to serve and be active in service. First Corinthians chapter 3, look at verse 9. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. You know, one of the things I love about this verse of Corinthians is the fact that we're not just laborers serving God, but he's there with us. You know, he's the general. The, hey, he's the, the chief commander. There is no one higher than him. 
You know, we are serving with him. He is active in the battle just as much as he wants us to be active in the battle. You know, we have to be engaged. We have to. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Turn over a few chapters to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Man, this, this passage here, if this doesn't get you excited, you know, I, I don't know what, what to do. Man, I, 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 you need a shot of adrenaline or something this morning. No, no, what you need to do is you need to go back and eat some more of those sugar donuts. You know, <laughs> so, you know, and I don't know if it's the sugar donuts that, that are pumping me up this morning or, or God's word. I, I like to say it's God's word this morning. You know, I, I, there's just, there's a need, folks. Like I said, you know, I, I've, I've got friends of mine that my heart breaks to see in the position that they're in. To see what the devil has done to their marriages. To see what the devil has done to their lives. To see the influence that's been stolen away because of being entangled. Because of, uh, of not being engaged. Because of someone else not being engaged. You know, I'm harder on myself than I am on others. And I look at those times and think, what could I have done more? Lord, what, what is it that you could have allowed me to do to be engaged more to help those individuals? We must be actively in serving. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, look at verses 55 through 58. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 58. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You realize that two of the points we've already gone over are encapsulized in this verse. He talks about enduring, standing firm, not allowing, not giving up ground. Hey, when you go to war, there are strategic positions you have to hold. And if you do not hold those positions, it could mean the war, the battle's lost. You know, even, even, even the war being lost at times. You know, look at the Revolutionary War. You know, there are the Civil War. Key positions that if they did not hold, our country would be completely different than it is today. Same thing spiritually speaking. We have to stand our ground. We have to be engaged. You know, God tells us that our labor, the work, the service that we are putting in is not in vain. You may not be able to see the results right now. You may look at it and say, you know what, I feel like I'm banging my head up against the wall and and I don't feel like I'm gaining any grounds. But it may be years down the road where you see that, where you do see that that it's coming through. You know, this is one of the things that I constantly have to remind myself as a pastor to encourage myself in the Lord. Hey, I may not see the results now, you know, but later on down the road we may be able to. You know, how often have we, you know, babe, how often have we seen in the last 10 years of working in the ministry, you know, slow progress. And now individuals, that their lives are completely changed. Didn't see it at the time. We thought, man, there was no way. You know, I think in your mind, man, is there really hope? You know, is what we're doing really mattering? Let me tell you this, it is. It, it does matter. God tells us your labor for him will not be in vain. Nothing you do for him is going to be in vain. Colossians chapter 3, don't turn there, but Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 through 24. If you're taking notes, you can write it down. And whatsoever you do, or ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men, knowing that the Lord ye shall receive the, the reward of the inheritance. You know, for ye serve the Lord Christ, engaged for, engaged for, do it heartily, everything. You know, hey, everything you do, everything you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, everything. Hey, that McDonald's employee that uh, is giving you a hard time on the intercom, you know, yeah, you, you ask, you say, oh, they're just not in a good mood, and you get to the window, hey, how's it going? Uh, wow. You know, <laughs> you know that, that, hey, maybe they need a little bit of encouragement. You know, what would Jesus do? You know, I had a lady that, ha- that it was similar to that this week. You know, uh, at McDonald's is one of my weaknesses. I'm confessing my sins. You know, but uh, I, I went to McDonald's this week to grab lunch real quick. I was on my way to a discipleship meeting, and and uh, I ended up, um, you know, going through the drive through and I had a lady that was that way, and you know, and you know what I told her? You know, at the, at the, uh, the window, I said, Look, ma'am, I go, it gets better. It gets better, and, and she looked at me, and, and she, she smiled. It was a genuine smile, and I, and, and I, and I, I was able to converse with her a little bit and said, I, I, I've worked for McDonald's before. I understand and get frustrated at times, and just being able to be an encouragement to anybody and anybody, everybody you can, serving God wherever you can, you know, going and making sure that you understand that everything you do should be done heartily as to the Lord, engaged for, 
Hey, you know, when you wake up, immediately engage yourself. When you go uh, to your job, you know, engage yourself. You know, you say, I could be engaged for Christ even though I work at a secular job. You better believe it. You better believe it. You know, I've worked secular jobs just like anyone else. You know, I worked for FedEx Freight, and I've been able to lead people to the Lord at FedEx Freight. I've been able to get people to come to church for the job I worked at. You can be engaged now properly, properly engaged. You know, I'm not telling you to witness on company time. You know, that's not, you know, that's not good. You know, it's, it goes against principle. You know, but hey, there are times you can witness. There are times where you can invite people to church. You can be engaged wherever you're at. It doesn't just have to be at church. It doesn't just have to be, oh, well, okay, well, it's time of the week again. Uh, it's 9.30 a.m. Got to be at soul winning. I'm engaged at soul winning, and that's it. No, it's everywhere you go at all times of the day, engaged for, engaged. The battle doesn't stop, folks. We can't stop either. You know, we have to, to, to soldier on for Christ. Be, be not entangled. Be engaged in. Be enduring for. Get enlisted. This Veterans Day... It's a reminder to us that we should be thankful for those who have served to give us the freedom we have. And let me again thank you, men and, and, and ladies, if there's ladies in here as well that have served in our country. You know, I, I often, often, often think about it, the fact that we get to grow up in a country because of those who are willing to sacrifice to give us the country we have today. You know, not only should today be a reminder of those who have served in our United States military, but also as a reminder to us that there is a spiritual battle waging around us. And as Christians, we must do our part for Christ. If you haven't trusted Christ as your Savior, let me encourage you to not miss the opportunity this morning to enlist on the winning side. Hey, folks, the battle does have an end, and we know what the end result is, and we do know who is going to win it. It is not going to be Satan. Satan's already lost. Make sure you're on the winning side. You know, I love that hymn. I am on the winning side. You know, I, I'm on the winning. Praise God, I'm on the winning side. Are you on the winning side this morning? Have you trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior? Don't miss that opportunity. If you are here today and you have already enlisted, you've already trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, is God speaking to you about enduring as a good soldier? not being entangled or, or being more engaged in, in God's army, if God is speaking to you to make a decision for him, please don't push him away. You know, every single one of us should evaluate ourselves on a daily basis. What can I do more for God? Not what can I do less. Be more engaged. Be making sure we're protecting ourselves, guarding ourselves from entanglement. Is God speaking to you about one of those areas this morning? Let's get more involved in serving Christ. Let's not allow the devil to win. Let's make sure that we are, are doing everything we can to bring others to enlist in Christ's army. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you, Lord, this morning for the opportunity, Lord, to take this, this truth, Lord, to look at your word. And, and, and you do talk about being enlisted, being a soldier in your army. Lord, there is a battle waging. Lord, and if it hurts us as Christians to see fellow loved ones and Christians, Lord, fall by the wayside, I can't imagine how much it hurts you. Lord, being our Heavenly Father, our Creator, our Savior. Father, I pray that if, if there's someone in here this morning that does not know you as their personal Savior, Lord, that they would take the opportunity to get it settled. Lord, that they would not end up on the losing side at the end of life. Lord, that they would end up on the winning side. Father, I pray that if there is someone in here this morning that you've spoken to them in some other area, Lord, that we've spoken about today from your word. Lord, help us to make the decisions we need to make. Lord, help us to soldier on for your son's sake. Lord, help us to endure, Lord, those times where it's hard to endure. Lord, I don't make light or take any lightness, Lord, when it comes down to those times that are hard times. We all go through them. Lord, but help us to not quit. Lord, help give us the strength that we need to endure those times, Lord, so that others may be led to you, so we can help lead more to you. And we'll give you the praise and glory and honor that you deserve for it. We can't do it on our own. We need our commander-in-chief in our lives guiding us, giving us the strength that we need. We give you the praise and glory and honor that you deserve in your son's name.
Amen. With heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, as we stand in the pianist's place, however it is God's spoken to you, you can come down to an altar at this time.